My name is Sonu Beatty. I'm an associate professor here in the government department and also the convener for the Legal Studies Working Group, which is a group of faculty members that are sort of interested uh, in the study of law. So I actually have the great pleasure today to introduce our Roger S. Aaron lecturer, Professor Mark Tush Tushnet from Harvard Law School. Let me say a bit about the Aaron lecture. Um, the Aaron lecture was uh, endowed by the Dartmouth Lawyers Association. Uh, Roger S. Aaron was a Dartmouth graduate uh, and a partner at Skadden Arps uh, and did mergers uh, and acquisitions. And uh, this uh, f um, lectureship is part of the Daniel Webster Fund, which is a larger fund dedicated to the study of law uh, and uh, the liberal arts uh, and sort of to bring uh, the study of law to uh, uh, undergraduate uh, education. And so let me just give out a few thanks. Uh, obviously, the Rockefeller Center, right, you see right here, uh, helped sponsor this. In particular, uh, Sadna Hall and, of course, Joanne Needham. Uh, without Joanne, uh, I don't know what we would do, right? So, um, and also the Dartmouth Lawyers Association that graciously funds uh, these lectures, as well as uh, the Dartmouth uh, Legal Studies uh, Working Group. Okay, so today's a uh, lecture is going to be delivered by Professor Mark Tushnet, who is William Nelson Cromwell Professor uh, at Harvard Law School. And so, you know, when you look at, like, CVs and you think, you know, you know how could you have any better of a record, uh, whether scholarly record or sort of, you know, the way you've made an impact in the field? And I don't think it gets better than uh, Professor Tushnet. Uh, he graduated from Harvard College and Yale Law School. He clerked for uh, Justice Thurgood Marshall on the Supreme Court. I mean, I was telling the, uh, he gave a lecture to the class today, and uh, you know, you often hear one of the leading constitutional scholars, you know, people speak like that. I can really confidently say, I mean, we are going to hear from the leading scholar of constitutional law and legal theory, in particular, comparative constitutional law. Uh, he is the author of like over 35 books and, you know, almost 100, over 100 other articles. Uh, uh, you know, you look at his, I mean, this is basically his CV, right, printed out. Um, you know, I didn't have the benefit of actually having him at Harvard Law School when I was there because he was not there, but my younger brother went to Harvard Law School and had him as a professor, and he <laughs> raved about him. Uh, he had him for the First, uh, First Amendment Law. And actually, uh, I have used, uh, and I don't think Professor Tushin knows this, I have used his casebook uh, here in uh, the First Amendment class, and I've also used his uh, Comparative Constitutional Law uh, casebook. Uh, so, uh, and his work uh, is uh, far ranging, and in particular, uh, he's been sort of skeptical uh, of the practice of judicial review, which has been a very provocative, uh, but also very interesting uh, component of his scholarly work. So with that, it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Mark Tushnet as our Roger S. Aaron lecturer. Uh, well, uh, thank you for that very generous I introduction. I'll say something about the First Amendment book in just a moment. Uh, and, and thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, give the Aaron lecture. Um, uh, just a, a note about the uh, First Amendment book. This is going to, you have to wait for the punchline of this, but uh, the First Amendment book in, in the, it deals with both uh, freedom of speech and uh, religious. Uh, the religion clauses of the First Amendment. Um, the freedom of speech uh, section of the book, I can say uh, confidently, is amazingly brilliantly organized. And I can say that because I didn't do it. Uh, my co-author, uh, Jeff Stone, uh, just figured out how to present the First Amendment, the free speech material in, a, in an unbelievably illuminating way. Uh, I tell my students when I teach the course that if they understand why the materials are organized in the way that they're organized, they will have a really deep understanding of, of free speech law. Okay, so that aside. Um, what I want to do in this lecture is offer a um, sort of a, a general or overall approach to uh, substantive constitutional law. Um, it's uh, an approach that is suitable, I believe, across at the very least a very wide range of areas uh, that are not always 
uh, treated in the same doctrinal formulations uh, under current law. Um, and I'll be using examples from uh, economic liberty and personal liberty um, and uh, other uh, areas as well, individual privacy, uh, to illustrate uh, the approach. The, I'll just sort of outline the approach uh, at the beginning and then uh, talk about uh, some of its details uh, as I go along. Uh, the general approach is to say, in a way, <coughs> uh, to use a term that I'll, again, I have to say a little more about, uh, that there is, uh, under the U.S. Constitution, a, a, a general right to liberty uh, with the implication that all government intrusions on that right uh, require adequate justification. Now, intrusions, as I've suggested, uh, range from restrictions on occupational choice uh, to restrictions on expression and individual privacy. Um, the form of the justification uh, is um, of a principle of proportionality. Uh, the idea of proportionality is developed reasonably well in the constitutional law of jurisdictions other than the United States. Uh, the Canadian formulation has been particularly influential. Uh, and I'll be drawing on uh, not particular doctrines from other nations, but from the way uh, other national systems have thought about proportionality in my uh, formulation. Um, the principle, I should say, of proportionality does have connections to uh, well-developed doctrines in the United States. Uh, and the general right to liberty has, I think, even deeper roots. So the first thing I want to say about the idea of a general right to liberty is, um, actually the first thing is a terminological point. Uh, uh, philosophers here will uh, bridle at the formulation uh, a right to liberty. Uh, if you think of the uh, uh, Declaration of Independence, it says we have an inalienable rights, among which are liberty. So liberty is not, liberty is in itself a right. You don't have a right to liberty. Um, I think that terminologically that's right, and I agree if, if philosophers want to quibble uh, or object, I don't have any response. Uh, my formulation, I think, is aimed at capturing something about the legal enforcement of uh, uh, prohibitions on intrusions on liberty. Uh, and we're, we're, we are, th I think, in our system uh, more comfortable in talking about uh, uh, whether you have a right that is intruded on uh, rather than talking about whether liberty is infringed. Uh, they are, I think, analytically equivalent. Um, so uh, I don't, again, the terminological point doesn't really matter a whole lot to me um, when put in, in the legal setting. The, in some ways, the background of the idea of a general right to liberty uh, can be phrased or can be said to combine two components, both of which are familiar, uh, but which together require uh, elaboration. Um, the first is the uh, general notion um, drawn from and embedded in uh, English constitutional theory, British constitutional theory, that in Great Britain, uh, everybody has a right to do anything unless it is prohibited by law. That is, uh, there's a general right to act, uh, which can be restricted, but only by law. Uh, so uh, there are these uh, cases in, 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 actually, this is a German case in which uh, there's an issue of uh, whether you have whether you have a right to ride a horse through a forest. Uh, under British law, you would have a right to ride a horse through a forest unless uh, 
that right were restricted by law. So you have a right to do anything you want uh, unless it's restricted by law. But in the British system, the, the second proposition, fundamental proposition of uh, British constitutional law is that uh, parliament can enact any restriction on this, on this general right uh, that it wants. So, uh, so yes, you have a right to ride through the forest, uh, but if uh, Parliament says uh, you can only ride on, ride on Tuesday mornings between 10 and 11, um, that's fine. There's no further objection that can be uh, made. Um, what, uh, what US constitutional theory, or in some sense constitutional theory in general, adds is that there are restrictions on the power of legislatures to intrude on your right to act. Uh, what those restrictions are is what we worry about in dealing with substantive constitutional law, but uh, the, the constitutionalism in a world of general liberty means that a, you have a right to do whatever you want unless it's restricted by a constitutionally valid law. Uh, and what I'm going to be talking about is uh, how do we uh, think about what, um, what, is, uh, what makes a law constitutionally valid. Uh, uh, now, the approach I'm going to take actually uh, has uh, been articulated in various ways, and I want to stress at the outset that you can find what I will call uh, left or liberal versions of the approach. Uh, I recently read a book by uh, Larry Yackel, who, who calls the approach equivalent to the one I'm dealing with here, uh, rational instrumentalism, and again, he's a liberal, in favor of finding constitutionally permissible a wide range of regulations. And a recent book, uh, Clark Nelly of the Institute of Justice has offered a uh, right-wing or conservative version, uh, which he calls judicial engagement, uh, which again, I think is related to the uh, approach that I'm offering. And, and so I think the approach that I'm going to suggest is not inherently um, tilted uh, politically one way or another, uh, although some of the components, I think, uh, will, at least as I articulate them, uh, lead to allowing more government regulations than the Institute of Justice would allow. Um, so uh, now, what are some examples uh, that of this uh, intrusions on a general right to liberty. Uh, well, uh, let me use, I think I'll be using know, several uh, repeatedly. Um, first, uh, some states have uh, um, laws regulating entry into uh, occupations. So uh, I believe it's Florida has a law requiring the licensing of florists. Uh, and uh, Louisiana has a law uh, prohibiting uh, the construction of coffins in, in, uh, without complying with a whole bunch of uh, regulations. <coughs> um, uh, uh, these are generally regarded by, I think, economists and I think also by lawyers who think systematically and sensibly about the problem is basically economically, economic protectionist legislation. That is, the restriction on uh, uh, the requirement of licensing for florists is aimed at excluding uh, people from becoming florists and thereby protecting the markets for existing uh, florists. Um, another kind of example that uh, uh, has come up historically and, uh, and versions of which are um, uh, uh, occasionally suggested uh, even today are uh, uh, rules uh, regulating the length of the hair that students can have. So in the 1960s and 70s, people uh, got very upset about students uh, having uh, long hair. Somehow it was a symbol of disre disrepute of, uh, or disregard of authority. 
uh, and 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 school boards enacted regulations saying you can't attend the school uh, if your hair is uh, inappropriately long and and you're a male. Uh, uh, the sort of current uh, equivalent are occasional proposals that you see. There's one recently in, in uh, Louisiana uh, to prohibit uh, the public wearing of, I really say, I can come up with this drawers. Uh, and pants that somehow down too much. Uh, um, so, though, uh, but, but also, and now more seriously, uh, and not more seriously, but in order to show the range of the uh, the uh, uh, approaches uh, um, uh, application, um, maximum hours and minimum wage laws uh, are restrictions on liberty, as the court uh, in the early 20th century uh, properly observed. Um, and as I'll suggest, uh, restrictions on the availability of abortion are restrictions on liberty as well. Uh, so now, so those are the kinds of things I, I'll be talking about. Now, uh, let me begin by outlining or begin with the outline of the approach. Um, first of all, I've used the language, uh, say, language saying uh, intrusions on uh, this right um, have to be justified. Um, I think the formulation or the use of the word intrusion or something equivalent is important uh, because uh, we, given the way our doctrine has been structured, tend to think about whether something violates a right or not. Uh, and uh, you have to, in order to get the approach I'm outlining uh, uh, working, you have to be able to distinguish between intrusions on liberty that don't violate liberty and intrusions that do violate. Uh, and, and the idea is basically all of the restrict, all of the regulations I've described, the droopy drawers regulation, uh, uh, minimum hours, minimum uh, wage laws, uh, all of them do intrude on a general right to liberty. They prevent people from doing something they want to do. Um, but only some of them uh, violate the liberty. Uh, and so, so we need, again, terminology that will distinguish between the intrusion, which is what triggers the constitutional, constitutional analysis, and the violation, which is the conclusion you draw at the end of, of uh, the analysis, or, or, or not. But you start out by saying, yes, there's an intrusion, and at the end you say, uh, the intrusion is justified, in which case there's no violation, or the intrusion is not justified, in which case there is a violation. Okay, so then the next step in the analysis is to uh, say, well, again, these intrusions are impermissible unless they are justified, so how do you go about justifying uh, the, intru the intrusions? Um, and here uh, there are if I have this right, I have five elements uh, in uh, my list here. It may be that uh, there would be a better way of enumerating them. Um, but uh, first of all, uh, you can say, well, an intrusion can be justified only if it, is, uh, if it serves a public purpose not a merely private purpose. A uh, um, couple of decades ago, my colleague Cass Sunstein uh, wrote an article, the title of which was Naked Preferences and the Constitution. And what he meant by naked preferences were uh, mere policy preferences that did not have any public justification but were simply the either expression of, uh, uh, again, mere preferences, desires, or more importantly, aimed at, merely aimed at securing the, uh, um, the uh, 
private advantages of some subset of the public. No public purpose, but only the private purposes. Uh, what's significant here is that the requirement of public purpose at least um, allows us to think about whether the economic protectionist legislation that I've described, the uh, florist uh, um, uh, licensing requirement, we can think about whether that is constitutionally permissible. Because if we understand them to be merely economically protectionist, then they are reflections of naked preferences in the sense that I've used. They don't advance a public purpose uh, and would be ruled out at the first uh, stage of, of the analysis. Uh, now, I've been careful not to say yet or whether the economic protectionist legislation is merely uh, the advancing of the private purposes of the protected group of florists and the like, uh, because it's not clear that, uh, because we'll require some analysis to distinguish among possible public or among possible purposes, some of which might be public, uh, and so might justify this kind of regulation. Uh, what that means is that the second step, the first step again then is to say, a regulation is justified if it serves a public purpose. Second step then is to identify the public purpose or purposes that the regulation satisfies. Uh, now, there are, um, there are difficulties that arise at this stage that, are, are, that I have to mention and then say what I think the right resolution of the problem is or what, um, what the better approach to the problem is. Uh, the first is uh, you could say that uh, in determining whether uh, regulation, again, that intrudes on liberty uh, serves a public purpose, uh, in determining that question, what you should look at is what the actual purposes of the enacting legislature were. What were they after? What were they trying to do? Uh, now, for a variety of reasons, uh, determining actual purposes is uh, often extremely difficult. There are typical uh, arguments, uh, well, there are two major arguments. Uh, one is that uh, legislatures and acting legislatures are multi-member bodies. Uh, and although you could identify the purpose of each one of the members, uh, you're not going to be able to aggregate those, add them up, and come up with a purpose of the legislative body itself in the sense of what, what, what it, the legislature, wanted to do. The legislature didn't want to do anything. Uh, but even if you come up with a solution to that problem uh, somehow by looking at, I don't know, uh, you might think you could get, get at it by looking at what people said in support of the legislation or who introduced it or whatever. Turns out that the second difficulty is, is also pretty severe, which is that in many settings, mostly at the state and local level, you just don't have very much information about what the folks in the legislature or the city council thought they were doing. So that even if you thought you could aggregate on the basis of some information you got, the information just isn't there. Um, and so with respect to a lot of these, maybe all of these kinds of regulations, uh, it's just hard to figure out or it, it, it's, probably doctrinally unsatisfying to say we'll ask whether we'll ask what the actual purpose was in order to determine whether there's a public purpose. <clears throat> the alternative is to impute some purpose to the legislation, to say, well, there it is. We, in this instance at least judges, but we as evaluators, uh, can uh, make some well, we can, we can 
create a construct uh, that we will call the purpose of the legislation. And then once we come up with that construct, we'll ask, well, is that a, a public purpose? Um, now, when I've tried to do this in other settings, um, sometimes people say, well, when you're imputing a purpose, uh, what you should do is try to come up with the most likely purpose or a reasonably likely purpose in the sense of what they were trying to do. And that gets us back to the problems with uh, actual purpose. And so the alternative is to try to think about whether there is a, or to, whether there is a plausible public purpose uh, which can be attributed to the legislation. Now, this is the approach, the, the uh, plausible purpose approach, is the approach taken by the uh, US Supreme Court in its doctrine dealing with uh, economic uh, regulations, like the protectionist ones I've described. Um, and uh, it leads to um, unsatisfying results, or results that seem, uh, seem at some fundamental level wrong. Uh, so take my uh, florist's uh, uh, licensing requirement. So the, the, why do you require the licensing of florists? Um, it's actually hard to come up with a sort of, well, you might say, well, we do licensing because we want to protect consumers from uh, bad services. Uh, but it's actually hard to figure out what a bad service by a flower arranger is. That is, you, people will look at the, the flower arrangement and say, uh, this is worth paying what they're asking for or not. There's nothing technically difficult about it. So what the defenders uh, of, of nothing technically difficult about the consumer assessing the quality of the flower arrangement um, so what the defenders of uh, florist licensing agreements, uh, uh, regulations say is, well, look, uh, some of these flowers are imported or they come from um, places where the consumer doesn't know, uh, and the soil in which they are planted might contain insects that we ought to worry about, or there might be insects on the flowers that are uh, things that consumers ought to worry about, but consumers don't know that this is an, an, an insect that they should be concerned about. And so we will require licensing of uh, florists, uh, one part of which will be a test to determine whether you know, whether you, the person seeking the license, can identify these problematic insects. OK, so now I've come up with a, um, a purpose that is public regarding. Uh, we don't want the, these uh, bad insects to uh, be distributed you know, more widely than they already are. Um, and yet, it seems pretty strained. Uh, the rationale seems pretty strained. Um, and so you might want to say, well, it's not just any imaginable purpose. It has to be um, a, I don't know what the right word might be, plausible purpose, uh, a sensible one, one that matches something serious, reasonably serious in the real world, um, something like that, okay? Uh, at this point, uh, another set of questions arise, uh, arises which is uh, about the relative competence of judges against legislatures. So again, to use the insects example, uh, you and I might think that the problem of the distribution of these bad insects is not really a serious one, uh, but maybe the legislature uh, had a different view of the seriousness of it, and maybe they knew more about them than uh, you and I do. Uh, and so in administering this plausible public purpose test, you have to have some degree of deference to the legislative judgment about the question, is this purpose 
really one that has some connection to real world problems. Uh, some degree of deference, that doesn't mean automatic deference, which is what the current uh, Supreme Court doctrine is. Now, where does this uh, approach have, or ha I don't want to say have bite, but uh, where, what's an illustration of how this approach might work uh, in a more uh, interesting context than uh, licensing for florists? Um, well, take uh, minimum wage laws, okay? Uh, the, again, the, the place where current doctrine about uh, economic regulation uh, uh, started, really. Um, on this approach, you'd have to ask uh, whether there's a public purpose for requiring uh, that workers be paid a minimum wage. And uh, the regular answer you get is, well, of course there's a public purpose in uh, boosting the wages, making it easier for low-wage workers to lead a decent life. Um, at that point, uh, a set of economists will come in and say, but in fact, when you look at the economic effects of minimum wages, it turns out that uh, their effect is to boost the wages of some uh, workers, uh, but to lower the wages of others, uh, to price some workers out of the market, to, to the standard example these days or in recent years has been uh, to make it uh, uh, impossible for uh, young workers to get entry level jobs from which they might learn a variety of, <coughs> might gain a certain kind of human capital that would allow them to move on to better jobs and so on. Um, now, that economic case is, I want to say, not implausible. There's empirical evidence to, to support it. There's empirical evidence the other way uh, as well. What do you say about the question, does the minimum wage serve the public purpose of enhancing the wages of low-wage workers, given this kind of disagreement? Uh, well, I think on my approach, I would say, Yes, there is disagreement among economists and it might, uh, among scholars of the field, and it might be the case that uh, the legislature is mistaken in thinking that increasing the minimum wage would benefit low wage workers uh, overall. It might be wrong, but on this kind of question, as on the question of whether these insects are a serious problem, uh, we have to give some degree of deference to the legislature. Uh, I would say that uh, I, the, the Flores example differs from the minimum wage example because even giving some degree of deference to legislatures on the insect question, it just doesn't seem good enough. Um, whereas, the question of deference or invoking deference in connection with the minimum wage uh, does seem to be uh, appropriate. Okay, so now we have, obviously with, with respect to particular regulations, we'll have a discussion about whether there is a reasonably plausible public purpose that justifies them. Uh, but at least we can have that discussion in an, in an open and coherent kind of way, I hope, I think. Um, uh, once we do that, once we say, uh, I should say, this is sort of like a flow chart, is there a public purpose? If there isn't, the statute's unconstitutional. Is the public purpose that we've come up with imputed to the legislation a reasonably plausible one given an appropriate degree of deference to the legislature? If the answer is no, it's not plausible, then it's unconstitutional. So now we're at the next step. We have a statute that has a reasonably plausible public purpose given an appropriate degree of deference to the legislative judgment. Um, the next question is, uh, is there another less liberty-restricting way 
of accomplishing the uh, purpose. Uh, uh, in current U.S. law, this less li restrictive liberty, less liberty restrictive way uh, gets described as, in some context, some doctrinal context, as asking, is there a less restrictive means for accomplishing the goal? Uh, the courts, U.S. courts don't always ask the less restrictive means test uh, question. Uh, the language I've used is drawn primarily from free speech law. Uh, there are some hints of it in some aspects of uh, uh, the law of affirmative action. What I'm suggesting is that the less restrictive means approach should be part of the general analysis of intrusions uh, on liberty. Uh, so uh, uh, again, to go back to the florist example, uh, assuming that there is a problem with these insects, uh, uh, there's a less, what you could say is, well, a number of things you could do. One is you could say, if you sell, if you, a florist, sell an arrangement that has one of these insects on it, you're, you commit an offense. It's a crime. Uh, uh, you can be a florist, and you know, there can be as many florists as, as want to do the job. Uh, you don't have to get a license to do it, but if you distribute these insects, then you're going to go to jail. Uh, or you could set up a system of inspections uh, in which the, you know, the, the, the people who do the inspections of restaurants inspect florists, the, excuse me, the florist uh, shop next door. Uh, so there are alternatives uh, of accomplishing the purpose. Now, in doing this less restrictive, and again, I want to stress, anybody can be a florist. Uh, we don't want these insects being disseminated, but we can prevent the insects from being disseminated by means other than uh, limiting access to the uh, profession of being a florist. <coughs> the problem with the less restrictive means alternative is um, that it's always possible to identify a less restrictive means. Uh, but there are, diff there are uh, but difficulties arise when you do that. Uh, now, there are two versions I want to offer of this, one in the minimum wage law and one in the, um, uh, the florist example. Uh, with the florist example, let's say, uh, let's suppose you say, uh, well, uh, an inspection system is less restrictive than a licensing scheme. Um, it is less restrictive with respect to the possibility of becoming a florist. But it's also more expensive. That is, the government has to pay the restaurant inspector more to inspect the florist shops, or it has to train them more so that they know not just that they're supposed to look out for grease in the restaurant and rats and cockroaches at the restaurant, but these insects at the florist uh, place and so on. And so uh, although the regulation or the alternative is less restrictive along one dimension, the liberty restricting dimension, it's not uh, less restrictive along the, let's call it the cost dimension. And you have to figure out what you're going to do about the increased cost associated with alternatives. Um, this is a problem that's been known for now f more than 40 years, and the courts have never adequately addressed it. There's a, a great note written by a law student uh, identifying this problem, uh, again, like in 1976, um, and, and courts just ignore it. Um, the other thing that people say is, well, <clears throat> you just have to ignore the increased costs associated with uh, less restrictive alternatives. Um, it's not clear why you have to do it. it uh, I mean, to the extent that there's a rationale, it is, well, we're concerned about the liberty dimension. The cost, as I've suggested, 
uh, works along some other dimension, as it's called, a mere policy dimension. And so, uh, so it's not relevant to the constitutional analysis. On my approach, it would be relevant. Um, uh, more seriously, in the minimum wage context, so again, it's, uh, there is a less restrictive liberty, uh, less restrictive uh, alternative. Uh, it's an easy one. Uh, remember, minimum wage laws say you or I can't enter into a contract to perform work at lower than the prescribed minimum wage. That's <coughs> the restriction on liberty. <coughs> and it's done, we restrict liberty to ensure that uh, workers have adequate wages. But there are other ways of ensuring that workers, uh, we, sorry, workers are able to live decent lives. We don't care about their wages in themselves. We care about the lives they live as a result of earning money. But there are other ways of ensuring that they are able to lead uh, decent lives Again, the most obvious one is something like the earned income tax credit. So you get a job, you contract to work at less than the minimum wage, and the tax system uh, gives you uh, tops off your income uh, through the earned income tax credit. Your liberty isn't restricted, and you are able to live at a, a, a decent uh, level. So that's another example, more serious one, of being able to identify uh, a less restrictive, le less liberty restricting uh, method. Uh, here too, I think, uh, there's some degree of deference to legislative judgments is required. <laughs> and it, in the minimum wage example, I think at reasonably low levels of deference, you'd have to say, well, legislature can choose between minimum wage and earned income tax credit. Uh, we'll defer to their choice. If they choose one, it's okay. If they choose the other, it's okay. Uh, even if the first one, the minimum wage law, is liberty restricting. Um, this may be a way, this uh, reasonable degree of deference may be a way of handling the cost issue associated with all less restrictive means approaches. That is, you could say, yeah, we'll take uh, costs into account, we'll, but unless the cost increase of the alternative is really pretty dramatic, we won't defer to the legislative judgment. If it's relatively easy to come up with an alternative at a relatively low co additional cost, uh, we're not going to say you, you can, it's okay with us if you want to save the extra $100. Uh, on training the uh, the workers, the the inspectors. Um, okay, so now we have a system. We, we're at the point where we're saying uh, there is a reasonably plausible public purpose that's hard to accomplish in some less liberty restricting way. Uh, the next question then is. Uh, um, just this, these are just formulating questions. Uh, to what extent does the regulation accomplish the public purpose that we've imputed to it? Uh, and uh, how severe is the infringement on uh, liberty, the intrusion on liberty? Uh, and this is just an, at this point, just an evaluative question of these two dimensions or these two components. Um, so with respect to flower arrangers, uh, florists, yeah, it's true maybe that licensing does do something to advance the purpose of preventing the dissemination of these uh, insects, but it's not going to do very much. It'll do something, but it won't do very much. Um, the minimum wage law, uh, maybe it does something to improve the uh, the uh, living, uh, the, the overall living conditions of workers. Uh, maybe it doesn't. That's what the, the economists I've cited would say. Um, so it's not entirely clear um, uh, how the evaluation of the effectiveness of the regulation is 
uh, in the minimum wage context. It's less clear to me, I think, in the uh, minimum wage context than in the florist context. Um, uh, okay, so uh, then what, what, what's the interference with liberty? Um, here it's uh, tricky, actually. Um, the minimum wage law probably interferes with liberty or intrudes on liberty more than florist licensing arrangements do uh, because, just crudely put, the minimum wage requirement is economy-wide. Uh, so you can't find anybody who will employ you uh, as uh, uh, at, at uh, below the minimum wage. It's illegal to do it. Uh, again, that's a little crude, but that will capture the idea. With respect to the florist, there are other employment opportunities that the person who wants to be a florist could engage in. Uh, and, and just to sort of capture this, uh, you might find somebody who says, well, in, in arranging flowers, I find a way of expressing, uh, of a way of which I am actually capable of performing, of expressing a certain artistic temperament. Uh, I can see what a nice flower arrangement is like. Uh, uh, but even with respect to that, there probably are other ways of satisfying your desire to express your artistic temperament in a job. Um, uh, the example that I use, uh, this was years ago, uh, I, I was impressed by um, a conversation my mother had about uh, with, she, she would go to um, uh, schools for the training of hairstylists to get her hair done. Uh, and uh, her point, I think correctly, was that this was a way in which people who wanted to be artistic uh, but were constrained in other ways uh, were able to find a job that allowed them to express their artistic impulses. So, so yes, florists can do that, but there are other things, other ways uh, that you can do it as well. Um, OK, so now we have whatever we've come up with. I, I, again, I'm not suggesting answers to these questions, but we've come up with an evaluation of the uh, extent to which the regulation accomplishes the imputed public purpose uh, and an evaluation of the extent of the intrusion on liberty. And then the final question is, is, is the amount of infringement or intrusion warranted or justified in light of the extent to which the regulation accomplishes the purpose. Now, I can't offer any, any, I don't want to offer any conclusion on the examples that I've used. Uh, I do want to note a couple of things. First of all, the approach I've taken, this five-step approach, is uh, maps on reasonably well to the uh, doctrine of proportionality as articulated, as I said, by the Supreme Court of Canada and followed widely around the world. It's the first observation. Um, the Canadian approach, I think, divides the steps into four, but I think there's a one, one of them has a sub-step, so it may actually be the same five steps that I'm uh, concerned with. Um, second, the last step, the, is the amount of intrusion warranted step, is described in um, the literature on this topic for other systems as the question of proportionality as such. And you can understand why. That is, is the intrusion proportionate to the gain? Or is the gain proportionate to the intrusion? So, so it's the proportionality as such step of the analysis. And at least until recently, there had been a sense among commentators on the use of this system that, that courts tried to terminate the analysis before reaching the proportionality as such stage. Because it, this evaluation about is the intrusion justified given 
the accomplishment of the public purposes, that really does look like a rather legislative type judgment. And courts, until recently apparently, uh, were reluctant uh, to engage in it. Um, okay, so now the, I, I've outlined the approach in connection with economic regulation, uh, uh, entry, into, uh, entry into occupations, uh, and uh, the um, minimum wage. Uh, let me just note that, uh, in, as a way of reaching a conclusion, that we can see similar kinds of things in other areas, probably for most of us or you, more consequential. Um, so the, the uh, current doctrine with respect to regulation of abortions is that regulations of abortions, of the availability of abortion, are permissible uh, if they do not impose an undue burden on the, as it's put in the doctrine, on the woman's right to choose. Okay. Um, I think it's more, I don't know what the right word is, transparent to say a woman, there, this elides an important issue that I'll mention at the end, but a woman has a general liberty right to obtain an abortion, which can be restricted only by legislation justified pursuant to a public purpose. Okay? Now, again, putting aside an obvious issue, which I will mention, well, <coughs> there's an obvious issue here which I will mention, which current doctrine doesn't take into account, which is, is it a public purpose, public purpose to um, do something to, it's, it's, the formulation of this is very complicated in detail, but to, in a shorthand, doctrinally is preserve the potential life of the fetus, uh, or the potential of the fetus to emerge from the woman's body to become what all concede is a person entitled to full constitutional protection. Um, uh, the court's dog, the undue burden analysis that the court has adopted doesn't handle that purpose well at all. Uh, uh, and, and just at the, at the base of it is, is if, if you regard that as a public purpose, it's really going to be hard to find anything justified. Uh, not impossible, not but you'd have a much more, you'd be willing to uphold many more regulations than the court has been willing to uphold. Uh, so I just want to put that aside and say one, there are a range of public purposes that the court has accepted de dealing with the uh, medical condition, uh, treating the abortion process as a medical process, so safety, informed consent, and the like. Uh, the undue burden analysis doesn't deal carefully with whether or how various regulations either do or do not advance the imputed medical purposes. Uh, this approach would. You say, OK, the imputed medical purposes, again, I'm putting aside the life of the fetus point, but the imputed medical purposes are a plausible public, public purpose of the legislation. Uh, how well does this particular regulation, a regulation requiring, these are current examples, requiring that uh, uh, those who perform um, uh, abortions have admitting privileges at a hospital within a certain distance, uh, uh, okay, so 
how, you'd want to know how often medical emergencies occur that would, that would require the performer of the abortion to have admitting of privileges as against an emergency room admission and the like. At the, at the least, we can ask, we'd be, under this approach, we'd be asking questions that have some degree of, I <laughs> want to say, coherence to them. Um, I, I'm not saying we would agree on the answers, uh, and it might be that the, what dominates all of this discussion is the issue that I and the courts generally have put aside, which is the life of the fetus issue. But if we were to focus, we can make more sense of the undue burden standard by treating it as a proportionality requirement in the structured way that I've suggested than the courts have been able to do. Um, okay, so I, 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 okay, I think I'll just stop with that. Uh, there may be uh, uh, examples from freedom of expression that we could uh, talk about as well, but I think it's better to open this uh, now for discussion. So I'm told that I should prefer students first, so volunteer. Oh, and there's a microphone in back. So, anybody? Okay, it looks like students are hanging back. So, <laughs> um, so I just wanted to ask about the Here, you, you should just just hang on for the. Um, I just want to ask about the analogy to the undue burden test because it seemed like you were saying that the proportionality or the proportionality reasoning is basically uh, weighing the harm against the benefit. And the undue burden test seems to just be setting a minimum standard, like not, it doesn't seem like a, a weighing test, it's just a threshold test. So I don't necessarily see those as the same. So, um, so my thought is that um, something like a comparative or uh, something like this proportionality judgment is built into the term undue. Some burdens are permissible. They're not undue. Some are impermissible. They're undue. How do we sort out? The permissible from the impermissible ones, and I think the I, I think the answer is by comparing. Sort of, we have a uh, an intrusion on liberty uh, and a public purpose that's being accomplished by regulation number one, the admitting privileges regulation, uh, and we have a different public purpose, a, a different intrusion, and a different. Um, uh, um, um, public purpose with a um, sonogram regulation and we have to see sort of <coughs> compare the ratios to see whether one is undue or permissible. That's my intuition. I may be wrong. It may be that the threshold analysis is the right one. The courts have not done much with the yet with the idea of undue burden. I think over the next two years, uh, the US Supreme Court is gonna have to elaborate on the idea of undue burden, but it hasn't yet. Uh, yeah. Hi, uh, I had a question about legislative deference um, and in the sense that if you give too much legislative deference to uh, legislatures, then they can kind of achieve like dubious purposes um, with laws. Like what came to mind for me was voter identification laws where um, the reported public purpose is to prevent voter fraud, but um, one of the more nefarious purposes that critics say is it's um, supposed to depress voter turnout for Democrats. Um, so if you give too much legislative deference, doesn't that sort of allow the nefarious purposes that don't necessarily achieve public good um, to go through? Um, so let me use that example. Uh, the uh, uh, de deterring uh, 
in-person voting fraud is clearly a public purpose. Okay, so we're now past the uh, first two steps. There is a public, there is a, a, a public purpose, and it's a, um, a, a plausible one in the circumstances. Uh, uh, I, w I would, the next question would be, is there another way of restricting, of accomplishing the purpose? And the answer may be no. Uh, maybe requiring a, an ID at the time of voting is the way of, uh, the best way, uh, or a pretty good way of deterring in-person voting fraud compared to post uh, hoc prosecutions and the like. Uh, and, and then we're at the something like the proportionality uh, as such question, which is <clears throat> what's the extent of the problem uh, and what's the extent of the intrusion on liberty? Uh, and here, you know, you'd want to ask uh, on the first, um, with some degree of deference, how serious is the problem of in-person voting fraud? And you know, critics of these things, uh, statutes say, well, if you look at the number of prosecutions, it's extremely low. Uh, that's not really, you know, a completely adequate measure because the whole point of this is that there might be undetected fraud that could be detected through a voter ID. Nonetheless, if, if you come up with relatively low levels of observed fraud, you might think that the level of undetected fraud is probably reasonably low too. Uh, and then you want to ask something that the courts have been asking, which is what's the degree of intrusion on, on liberty? So how many people are unable to come up with these IDs and so on? And, and then you say, is the accomplishment of the deterrence goal justified by, or is the um, intrusion on the liberty of this number of people, whatever it is, justified by what you're getting out of the requirement, which is deterring uh, in-person voting fraud? Uh, and, and okay, so that's a way gets you a way of formulating the question, and 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 you know, you don't have to. You, it might be that the real purpose is not deterring in-person voting fraud. Um, I gave reasons for trying to avoid an inquiry into the real purposes as part of this. Uh, I think you can make a fair amount of progress on this problem by using an approach that doesn't look at, doesn't try to determine real purposes. And I think if you can do that, if you can make progress, um, that's a good thing. Yeah, you were. Actually, just as a, I think this is kind of a follow-up, is that I'm, I'm intrigued, though, by your use of the word plausible, because plausible has, as part of its definition, believability. Um, whereas, I mean, I know why you're deliberately avoiding the idea of rational basis review, because, and, but in a certain ex to a certain degree, it sounds a little bit like in your plaus, is it plausible it's rational basis that you, it really is that you're using. Like, can can a person actually rationally see the connection between A and B? Yeah. So I I would say that um, I use the term plausible. You're right to avoid the doctrinal connotations of the term rational. Uh, in some of the stuff that's been written in this area, people talk about rational basis with bite. Uh, that's more like uh, what I'm talking about as plausibility. Um, but it's even, so let me give you an example of why something like plausible is Better. It may not be the, exactly the right word, but something is, is, 
probably better than rational basis, even rational basis with byte. One of the, the, the key cases for the strengthened rational basis test is a case called City of Claiborne versus Claiborne something or other center, which involved a zoning, uh, application of a zoning ordinance so as to exclude a group home for people with mental disabilities from the area justified on the ground that, um, that uh, in the event, uh, among other things, in the event of a fire, it would be more difficult to evacuate the residents of the group home uh, because they were people with mental disabilities, might panic more, and so on. Um, that seems to me uh, a rational argument, okay? Uh, it also seems that it probably, sh that the court was right in saying it's not enough. The court, has to, the court has to say, well, that's not a rational basis. Uh, but then it invalidates it, and I say, and other people say, well, you must be doing something more than a uh, rational basis in invalidating it. Um, maybe plausible doesn't, is not the right word, because maybe this safety during evacuation is a plausible reason. So I might need something better than a word better than plausible, but it's, it's ratcheting up the evaluation of the purpose that you can come up with for a public purpose that you can come up with. Uh, yeah, over there. Um, I guess when, you're talk when you were talking about justifying the intrusion on our liberties, um, you talked about one of the difficulties with determining whether there's a plausible public purpose. Um, there's not enough information out there considering there are, some, there's the multi, there are multi bodies on our legislation. Would you argue that a more consequentialist approach in determining whether um, a legislation is constitutional is more effective? Uh, <coughs> so I'm a little nervous about applying uh, purely uh, a test that would ask only how, how effective this thing is in making the society better off uh, or even in doing what we think it might be plausibly designed to do. Uh, I, I wouldn't rule it out in, in ways associated wouldn't rule it out for reasons associated with this point about undue burden as a threshold. Um, it might be that we could get a lot out of saying, well, uh, the rule is you, you have to accomplish more than a little. But once you accomplish more than a little, uh, it's okay. Uh, the reason I'm nervous about that is that it doesn't take into account the significance of the intrusion on liberty. And, and <coughs> you know, I think there are variations uh, in those intrusions. The, the um, inability to practice an occupation is more, serious than an, in a, in a, is more serious than an inability to ride your horse in the park or in the forest. And I think uh, the analysis of regulation should take that into account. Uh, yeah. Um, just out of an abundance of caution, I'd say it's tied to the particulars of U.S. constitutional history. Um, the reason I, I'm not sure what I would say about it being a natural right. Um, but the reason I hesitate is that I, I can imagine what I think of as constitutional cultures that do acknowledge limitations on government power uh, 
but are more, to use now an older term, communitarian in their or orientation and so would tolerate greater intrusions than our constitutional culture would. Um, so, so, uh, so it's just a hesitation. Okay, just, just to follow up for a second, please. So if it's a feature of our constitutional regime, then does this mean it's at odds with the notion of enumerated rights? To oh, yeah, well, yes. I mean, <coughs> the aim is to uh, subsume almost all enumerated rights and lots of things that have been described as unenumerated rights within this general approach. That's clear. That is a clear motivation on my part. Um, yeah, I think you're... Me? Yeah. Uh, so, even uh, if one sees uh, your proposal as, as doctrinally elegant, um, shouldn't the massive expansion of power of judicial review in a sort of fairly free-form, free-floating way give great pause to anyone who's not a fairly hardline libertarian or deeply, extremely suspicious about democratic legislative institutions? Um, so, so it's a complicated question for me to, or it's my response to the question is complicated because I am deeply suspicious about judicial review generally. Uh, but um, I also think that we have, a no we in the United States, have a number of restrictions on liberty that are uh, diff extremely difficult to justify. Uh, and what I'm aiming for is an approach that would uh, allow us to, allow the courts to say, these are uh, these problematic, what I've been calling the economic protectionist regulations, uh, really are, are um, unconstitutional without saying, as a consequence, the um, <coughs> minimum wage laws are unconstitutional. <coughs> now, no doctrine can guarantee results, right? So, yes, if you set down on this path of proportionality, it might be that you would find some deeply libertarian courts saying that the minimum wage law is disproportionate given the availability of an earned income tax credit uh, as a less liberty restricting way. That might, might happen. Uh, a lot of work in my approach is done by the question of the degree of deference that courts will give. Uh, and what I'm, trying to suggest is that the degree of deference should be, there should be some deference given, but less than is given under current doctrine. Uh, but again, not no deference, not free floating. Uh, um, whether that's a, that can be done, you know, is not, I mean, who knows? The European courts, I mean, they have a language for this. It's from the European uh, uh, Union law, not from European human rights law, but they talk about a margin of appreciation. That's the idea of deference. Uh, and in European Union law, the margin of appreciation is reasonably robust. Uh, so there is some deference, uh, a non-trivial amount of deference, but there's some things that just fall outside that. That's what I'm hoping for. Yeah. See, so you talked a lot, uh, the whole talk was about, you know, the qualifications for the type of test or whatever that would be used by the court in determining whether a regulation is constitutional. So my question is, how binding would, are those tests are on future courts? So couldn't a future court say, uh, we're going to use a different test than the undue burden test or something like that in order to determine constitutionality. Um, so I, I, I may be un misunderstanding the question, but, but my immediate response is, well, yeah, you can't, by saying today, this is the way we should think about the problem. Uh, 
you can't guarantee that courts in the future will think about it in the same way. Uh, uh, all that you can do is say, uh, here's the way we today think is the best way of thinking about these problems, and here are our reasons for doing it. And then you hope that those reasons will continue to be persuasive for uh, judges in the future. But there's no way of, of guaranteeing it. Uh, I was wondering about the less restrictive means test, and you mentioned cost as another factor that the courts ought to take into consideration when considering less restrictive means. And I was wondering if there were other dimensions that you thought courts should also take into account. And I have in mind, in particular, some idea of social equality or equal status. And so it seems like there might be cases where the less restrictive means is worse on the score of social equality. So some people might make that argument about uh, minimum wages versus EITC or some of the like medical prohibitions in the abortion cases, like instead you would have to go before a, a board and justify yourself. That might be worse by the score of gender status, um, right. equal status or something like that. <clears throat> uh, my answer is that um, analytically, those things should bear on the question of less whether the means is in fact less restrictive. Um, uh, again, I, I sort of just use the language I've used before. Um, what we're talking about is a situation where we can agree that the means is uh, less restrictive along one dimension, but might be more restrictive along another dimension. Now, the equality or dignity, dignity interests, um, I now have to, I want to think more about that. Um, maybe the way to say, deal with that is to say that, I have, have to think more about this, but that the the intrusions on dignity operate along the same dimension as the intrusions on liberty. And so it might be the case that you've, the alternative um, interferes with liberty less, but interferes with dignity more. I think that might well be the case with a minimum wage. Situation where you know, there is a long-standing tradition of talking about the dignity of labor, and uh, the the uh, a check from the government uh, might not uh, promote the dignity of labor in the way that working at a job for a pre required minimum wage would. Maybe that's the way to think about it. So it's not the not other dimensions. It's, but 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 I want to say my formulation that would lead me that would require me to think uh, to expand the structure of the analysis quite generally to say well what we're talking about is a, a test of proportionality as applied to regulations that intrude on a set of interests some of which are liberty and some of which are dignity or equality uh, interests. Uh, my guess is that it's uh, adaptable, the approach is adaptable, but I frankly haven't thought about how, how you do it. Yeah. Um, I kind of just wanted to get your thoughts on the uh, deeply rooted test and how, like, to what extent the court should use it. Um, or if they should use it at all? Yeah. Uh, so uh, I think it's relevant. That is, the claim that this is a liberty that has been uh, widely recognized in the past uh, is uh, 
Well, actually, let me let me start too too soon, uh, too too quickly. Um, now that I I started down the wrong path, actually, now I, I think the answer is no. Probably it shouldn't matter uh, because. An intrusion on liberty is an intrusion on liberty, whether there's been a lot, whether historically there have been a lot of such intrusions or very few, shouldn't matter. With respect to whether there's an intrusion on liberty, which is the way the deeply rooted test works, it's a trigger test. Uh, the fact that there have been many regulations of this liberty uh, that have been found thought permissible in the past may have some bearing on later steps in the analysis. Uh, it might, where they would come in might vary depending on exactly what the regulations were and what the tradition were, but not, I think not at the initial, uh, again, triggering stage. Okay. Thank you.